This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Juma Vishwas. I am going to present a very important topic for MRCOG part 2 and part 3, that is management of adnexial mass in pregnancy. And as you know, that is quite common in the pregnancy and the good thing is that mostly are benign, so we can manage conservatively, but we need to know important uh, differential diagnosis of adnexial mass and uh, what's the cutoff of management of, um, of the adnexial mass conservatively. So you can see that adnexial masses in pregnancy are common and overall prevalence is 0.19 to 8.8%. And you can see that uh, the chances of uh, becoming malignancy in the pregnancy is very, very rare, like one in 1,500 to 32,000 pregnancies. Management of adnexial mass relies on the ability to differentiate between benign and malignant, as because benign masses are either resolved spontaneously or we can be managed conservatively during pregnancy. And these are the differential diagnoses of adnexial masses. So here you can see it can be benign or it can be malignant. Regarding benign, it can be gynecological. For an example, it can be follicular cyst, corpus luteal cyst, hemorrhagic cyst. Uh, Non-gynecological can be appendicular mass, pelvic kidney, mesenteric cyst. Malignant, it can be borderline, epithelial, germ cell, sex cord, stromal tumor, metastatic. Some adnexial masses can be unique to pregnancy, like hyperstimulated ovaries, uh, hyperreactio luteonalis, and theca luteal cyst. So let's talk about few common adnexial mass in pregnancy. So the first is the corpus luteal cyst. Corpus luteal cyst, uh, the main important thing is that it produces progesterone and it supports the pregnancy in the first uh, uh, trimester of the pregnancy. Adnexial cyst can be spontaneously regressed by eight weeks of pregnancy when placenta take over uh, progesterone function and is very important to differentiate corpus luteal cyst from the pathological cyst because inadvertent surgical resection can lead miscarriage. And uh, the corpus luteal cyst is very highly vascular and there is a high prone to spontaneous hemorrhage or rupture. If corpus luteal persists after eight weeks, it appears like a simple cyst later in the pregnancy, but it will disappear during follow-up. Follicular cyst, a physiological cyst, and it's usually less than two centimeter in diameter. It occurs as because of failure of involution or failure of mature follicle to spontaneously rupture, result in a follicular cyst, which is usually 2.5 to 6 centimeter in diameter. Recognizing a follicular cyst enable a conservative management approach as it typically resolves before 16 weeks of gestation. Hemorrhagic cyst um, usually is present as an acute abdomen. So uh, the presentations are like certain abdominal pain, which usually resolve within a few days. If the woman is clinically stable, in that case, you can manage conservatively only by giving simple analgesia. Uh, this hemorrhagic cyst is usually benign, but the problem with the hemorrhagic cyst is that it has a various sonographic appearance, appearances uh, based on the duration of this cyst, and it's very difficult to distinguish from the malignant lesions. Presence of clot, for an example, may be confused for a solid needle. Color Doppler will show no vascularity within uh, the clot, whereas blood flow may be inadvantaged in a solid or papillary lesion. So this is a very good differentiating point. Uh, that's the where, how you can differentiate a hemorrhagic cyst from the malignant cyst. Hyperstimulated ovaries um, causes uh, bilateral enlarged ovaries. Uh, it mainly results from in vitro fertilization. So um, mild ovarian hyperstimulation usually affect one third of the cycle. Moderate to severe uh, ovarian hyperstimulation varies from 3.1 to 8%. In severe cases, ovary may be enlarged to more than 12 centimeter and there's a high risk of torsion and hemorrhage. In most cases, ovarian hyperstimulation is self-limiting and requires supportive management uh, while they are waiting for resolution. Uh, cyst drainage, usually we don't recommend it. Surgery is only indicated if it is associated with torsion or ovarian rupture. 
mature cystic teratoma. Uh, this is the commonest adnexial cystic mass uh, after 16 weeks of pregnancy. Dermoid cyst is less than six centimeter in diameter and generally asymptomatic in pregnancy. If dermoid cyst is more than six centimeter, there's a higher chance of torsion. Uh, and overall, you can see the incidence is about 27%. Malignant germ cell tumor, 38% uh, of the adnexial mass can be malignant. And the most common malignant germ cell tumor is this germinoma, but it have a very good prognosis. And um, regarding the management, that should be discussed in the MDT. And you can manage um, chemotherapy or radiotherapy because most of the germ cell tumor are sensitive to chemo and radiotherapy. Borderline or low malignant potential masses, uh, usually cystic lesion with malignant cytological changes, but they don't have any kind of invasion into the ovarian uh, stroma. And low malignant potential masses in pregnancy, either it can be mucinous or it can be serous epithelial tumor. PID also can cause ovarian masses, but is very rare in the pregnancy. PID infection, that is the pelvic infection, can arise from ascending infection or from infection of an ovarian cyst, ovarian endometrioma or hydrosalpings, or a superimposed infections of the necro necrotic tissues. An ovarian abscess is a recognized complications of transvaginal oocyte retrieval or trans -cervic uh, cervical embryo transfer. If it is confined abscess, it can cause severe uh, and sudden onset of pain and swinging pyrexia. If it is ruptured, then it can cause diffuse peritonitis. Acute PID management is similar with the non-pregnant woman that we treat. Uh, however, doxycycline is contraindicated beyond 15 weeks of pregnancy because of its um, teratogenicity, like it can cause tooth and bone discoloration and inhibit bone growth. Adnexial torsion is uh, one of the acute uh, condition, and in pregnancy, the chance is like one to five in 10,000 pregnancy. And it can occur at any time, but most common in first and early second trimester of the pregnancy. Clinical presentation is the same that's in a non pregnant woman. Mostly it's present with nausea and vomiting, and like 85% of the cases. And also, we can see WBC count in a high upper range. CRP also starts to rise six to eight hours after the onset of the torsion, and the peak level is like 24 to 72 hours. And on ultrasound, uh, we will see an identifiable a tender mass that has a thickened and edematous capsule with a bland and often avascular center. And if you diagnose the torsion, they need an immediate surgery, ideally by laparoscopy with adnexial detorsion, and aspiration of the ovarian cyst or ovarian cystectomy or salping ophrectomy. Prom surgery is very important for revascularization and preserve of the ovary. Appendiceal mast, uh, that's also um, you know, one of the commonest adnexial mass in pregnancy, like you can see one in 1500 pregnancies. This is the most common non-obstetric uh, operative procedures in the pregnant woman. As because you, you can see that the gravid uterus enlarges in the pregnancy. So before pregnancy, that will be in the right iliac fossa. At 12, 20 weeks pregnancy, you can see it will in, like it will be higher up. And on 34 uh, weeks of the pregnancy, that will be much higher up. So in the first trimester, that will be in the right iliac fossa, in the pelvic brim, in the second trimester in the lower right upper quadrant in the third trimester. So it's very important to di distinguish the location of the appendix uh, when you diagnose it as an acute appendicitis. So when we assess the adnexial masses, so uh, mostly we do the ultrasounds with color Doppler to differentiate any adnexial masses. If any kind of confusions over there, or if we suspect any kind of uh, adnexial carcinoma, in that case, we can do MRI or CT scan. And also, along with that, we also do the tumor marker studies. So now I'm going to discuss different uh, characteristics of uh, uh, um, characteristic findings of the uh, different uh, adnexial mass in ultrasound. So in corpus luteal cyst, you will see that there will be simple to complex cyst 
And uh, it, we can also see that internal debris and the cyst wall is very thick. And typically it is surrounded by a circumferential rim uh, of color Doppler flow. Um, we can term it as a ring of fire. Follicular cyst, usually very simple cyst, you can see. Uh, they are measuring about 2.5 to 6 centimeter in diameter. You can see it's completely cyst, uh, simple cyst, like any quick cyst with a thin wall without any septation or vegetation. In hyperstimulated ovaries, you can see the, the ovaries are bilaterally enlarged. And you can see that uh, there will be a vascular ecogenic stroma surrounded by a multiple cyst. So each multiple cyst is surrounded by a vascular ecogenic um, cyst. So it gives an appearance of spooked wheel appearance. It also, it is associated with ascites. In dermoids, it's also bilateral. And you can see that characteristic appearance of hair and sebum, it gives the appearance of white ball sign. Malignant germ cell tumor, you can see it will be a solid mass. It will contain uh, within the mass, you can see some aniquic areas because of internal hemorrhage or necrosis. Borderline ovarian tumor, usually unilocular cyst, you can see, and with multiple vascular mural wall. These are the multiple vascular mural wall nodules or papillary projections you will see. These are the papillary projection. Endometrioma, it will give a ground glass patterns uh, due to the presence of old blood within the cyst. Fibroid, it's usually hypoechoic, well circumscribed, solid masses. Cystic changes may be seen if red degeneration occurs. Hydrosalpings, usually thin wall tubular structures, you will see here, containing aniquic fluids. And also you will see bits on uh, string appearances because of the remnant of the endosalpingeal fold. Tubo ovarian abscess, you will see it will be very thick wall, ill-defined, multi-loculated, cystic and solid lesion. Torsion, you will see the ovary will be very enlarged and edematous with uh, follicles, peripherally arranged. These are the follicles. Twisted vascular pedicle described as a wire pull sign. So this is wire pull sign. Presence of flow within the ovary does not exclude the diagnosis because in late, you will see loss of Doppler signals. In MRI, only we do uh, if the mass is indeterminate or if we suspect any malignancy. Usually we do to a better characteristic of the tissue compositions, uh, fat, uh, and also assess ascites. In pregnancy, MRI is preferable to CT to avoid any kind of radiation exposure. However, CT is useful for assessing any thoracic metastasis and can be done with abdominal shielding. Uh, now let's talk about certain tumor marker we do in the pregnancy. So the first one is the uh, serum uh, CA125. So if you see the CA125, it's raised in over 80% of the women with epithelial ovarian cancer. And it's also produced from the decidua. So CA125 level also rise up in, in, during the pregnancy. And it reached the peak level in the first trimester and then slowly decline with advancing gestation. So if you see the cutoff, normal cutoff in a non-pregnant woman is 35, but uh, in pregnancy, the cutoff between 11 to 14 weeks, it's 112 units per ml. Okay, so if you see any high level of the tumor marker in the pregnancy, that is CA125, is, um, you have to see the cutoff as well, because CA125 can also be raised in pregnancy. Other tumor marker like LDH, uh, it is actually uh, indicate the dysgerminoma, but uh, it's a very useful marker in the pregnancy because its level is unaffected in the pregnancy. Alpha petroprotein ACG, we, usually we don't do these tumors uh, uh, be, um, markers because that level also rise up in the pregnancy. So it has it is very limited use in pregnancy. HE4 is a glycoprotein that is expressed uh, by the epi epididymal epithelium. Uh, it's increased in ovarian cancer and also increased in breast, lung, and renal cancer. It is not increased in endometriosis and less false positive rate with CA125. HE4 is thought to be more sensitive and specific than CA125 in distinguishing between benign and malignant ovarian masses. 
So if we use combinations of this, sensitivity rises from 73% to 76.4%. And also we do the risk malignancy index. So you can see that risk malignancy index, usually we do uh, by seeing the age, that is the menopausal status and also CA125 and also ultrasonographic findings. It is particularly useful in the woman with the postmenopausal woman with the ovarian cyst. And it has a very limited use in the pregnancy because as we know that the CA125 also elevated in the pregnancy. So in uh, uh, pregnancy with adnexual mass, we don't do any risk malignancy index. Um, other than that, we can also use the IOTA classification that is M rule and B rule. The same thing we do. The sensitivity is 95% and specificity 91%. If we see any of the M rules during the ultrasonograph, usually we refer the case to the gynae onco services. Regarding the conservative management, 76% uh, of the adnexial masses, the good thing is that they are simple and they are less than five centimeter in diameter. And another thing is that functional cysts often spontaneously resolve by 16 weeks of gestation and require no follow-up in the pregnancy. Follow-up ultrasound scan should be offered for longer or complex cysts at around 14 to 16 weeks of gestation. So if you want to do an intervention, we have to wait for 14 to 16 weeks to resolve all the simple cysts or the functional cysts uh, because it's very important because if you do any uh, operation for the luteal cyst that's supporting the pregnancy that can increase the risk of miscarriage. So this is very nicely explained how you're going to manage an adnexual mass in pregnancy. So if you see any features of acute abdomen, they need then and then surgery. If the cyst is asymptomatic, then you have to differentiate whether it is benign, intermediate, or any suspicious of cancer. If it is benign, then you have to look on the size of the cervix and also the features of the cyst. If it is simple, less than five centimeter, then no further action is needed. If you see the simple cyst more than five centimeter or complex cyst, they need a re-stand uh, in four to six weeks. If the cysts become resoluted, then no further action is needed. But if you see that there's no change in the size, then they need a re-scan six weeks postnatally. Regarding the intermediate or any suspicious of cancer, in that case, you can do MRI tumor markers and you can discuss with the MDT. If there is any very low index of suspicious cancer, then you can re-scan the, um, them again in four to six weeks. But any high suspicious of cancer, in that case, they need a surgery. These are the indications for the surgery. If you see it's any symptoms uh, related to acute abdomen, mass suspicious for malignancy, rapidly growing mass at a high risk of malignancy, or if you see the cyst is more than 10 centimeter, that can cause, may or cause obstruction to the labor, they need a surgery. Regarding the surgery, laparoscopy is the safest way we can do the operation. The advantage is that that can cause less blood um, loss, improve the visualizations of the pelvic organ, reduce the risk of uterine irritability in the laparoscopy compared with the laparotomy. But the problem with the laparoscopy is that there's a risk of um, carbon dioxide and pneumoperitoneum to the fetus. Hyper hypercarbia cause fetal acid-based disturbances. Sometimes that can also reduce the uterine blood flow, can also reduce placental flow flow, no difference in IUGR or stillbirth rate between laparoscopy and laparotomy managed cases, no adverse fetal outcome when laparoscopy is performed with pneumoperitoneum when the intraabdominal pressure is between 12 to 15 millimeter of mercury. So it's safely you can do the laparoscopy in pregnancy if the abdominal pressure is low. Like usually we make it 20 to 25, but in the pregnancy, that should be between 12 to 15 millimeter of mercury pressure. There's a potential risk of injury to the uterus during the insertion of the primary port or the varus needle. Alternative entry technique as in Hassan's or the Palmer entry points may be considered, especially when surgery is performed in the second trimester. A key consideration regarding the route and the feasibility of the surgery will be overall, the size of the uterus and mass, the solid component in the lesion and likely available intra-abdominal space to complete the procedures.
Laparotomy may be preferred in the minimized in advantage seat rupture, tumor cell dissemination, and pore size metastasis when the malignancy is suspected. If a patient required a laparotomy, when the site of incision may change with the gestation from suprapubic trans transverse or lower midline in the first trimester, lower or upper midline or para midline on the side of the mass in the later pregnancy. So from here, the take home message is that um, it's a very important to assess, um, to diagnose the acute condition like adnexal torsion and to determine whether the mass is malignant or not, which necessarily in, uh, like indicate that they need an intervention. And from here, the first line investigation um, should be ultrasound scan to rule out whether it is benign or malignant. MRI only you can indicate when there's an indeterminate or suspicious lesion. Most simple adnexial cyst resolves continuously by the second trimester. And main predictor, predictor for persistent uh, cyst are the cyst diameter more than five centimeter or it is complex uh, morphology at imaging. Surgery indicated in case of acute abdomen or high suspicious of malignancy. And the laparoscopic surgery is appropriate in most cases, depending on the tumor diameter, gestational age, and surgical expertise. So this is all about adnexial mass in pregnancy. Thank you for hearing today's session. Um, if you have any queries, you can uh, comment on the um, uh, the comment box, I will happy to answer over there. Thank you.